Hello, I'm George Potter. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. In our previous conversation with George Potter, we talked about his search for the real Mount Sinai. That leads to a very interesting claim. Could it be that Lehi's family in the Book of Mormon has a connection to Mount Sinai? I hope you join us for our next conversation. We'll also talk about George's search for the waters of Moses. Check out our conversation. Hey, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, I just uh, used a picture from my wife's watercolors of Mount, well, it's just a mountain, but we pretended it was Mount Sinai. So anyway, just would love to ha have some feedback on that, what you thought of that, if that was something interesting. And uh, she, she's trying to get more into art, artistry, and so anyway, just give me some feedback on that. Now back to our conversation. Now Moses had been a shepherd there for a long time. Okay, and the, actually the Muslims believe he was there for 40 years before he went back to Egypt because he had to work with Jephro. Okay, so let's, let's make sure I got the timeline on. So Moses was raised in Egypt mm -hmm. when he's probably in his 20s or so is when he killed the Egyptian and had to flee Egypt. Is that right? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the Muslims believe he was older. He was so older than he that? He was older than that, yeah. So, so he probably he... May 30s. So I, I don't know the exact thing. Okay. But he was in, they believe he was in Arabia for 40 years. You know, okay, he so had after to, he left, so yeah. you're saying after he left Egypt, mm -hmm. after he killed the Egyptian, yeah. he went to the land of Midian, as I recall, Right. and then he lived there for 40 years. Is 40 that what you're years. saying? Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Just making sure. Well, that's what, what's in the Quran, okay? So okay. it's not anything that we have a record of ourselves. But he knew that area very well. He knew exactly where the water would be found. Okay, so it's not like he was... Oh, you know, I got 600,000 people here. How do I support them? He knew where to go to get the water. So after he left, because he left, he left Egypt for a time, and then it, of course he comes back and parts the Red Sea and all of that stuff. So how long was he in Arabia before, um, before he returned to Egypt to, to take... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying the Arabs believe 40 years. 40 years, and then? That's, back? But that's what's... They believe it's not to anything I know. Okay, so okay. don't put me down and no, no, say no, they're I'm in just, forty I'm years. Just, I'm just trying to make sure I understand. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's one of those things in the in the movie Ten Commandments where he goes up on the mountain, he comes back, and all of a sudden his hair is gray. You know, so maybe it was forty years squeezed into some kind of a God's time period. Okay. I don't know, but anyway, he knew the area. He was there for a long period of time herding the sheep of Jethro, who was the sheikh of the area. It was okay. Jethro's wells. You can still see Jethro's wells there. It's the town of Midian. So, I mean, he knew the area. So he knew exactly where to take the people to find the water. So it wasn't like he was guessing or anything like that. He would have known where to go. And, and Sinai, where we believe is Sinai, had the resources to support the people for the time that they were there. And to find, you know, these Egyptian calves carved all around this, this mountain, a heathen um, sacrificial um, place on top of it, it fits in very well. I mean, it's all speculation, but everybody I take there says, man, this is it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can feel it. Well, I don't use the feel principle, um, but it's pretty amazing what you find there. Uh, interesting thing that was pointed out to me by Lynn Hilton is that before they built Solomon's temple, that Mount Sinai was still the temple that was used by the tribes of Israel. And that every year a party would go from Israel down to Mount Sinai to make offerings to the Lord. And so you see things down there like these marble columns in the middle of nowhere. And it kind of makes sense that that was a sacred place. But there's no other explanation for why all those things are there. So it marble the, columns, wouldn't that indicate more of a Greek influence? or? Well, Greek but, was the culture of a lot of, the, well, at least the time of Lehi and Nephi. That well, that, that would have was been much culture. later than Moses, though. Yeah. Right? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, they didn't have Corinthian. <laughs> there's no lentils, lentils on top of these columns. They're mm -hmm. just pieces of stone that made a right. column, so right. I'm sure it So predated. they could have come much later than... Yeah, okay. could have come much later. But there's no explanation as to why that stuff's just in the, sitting in the middle of the desert, except for that's Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. So it's pr pretty convincing if you go there. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I was, I was 
I was pretty interested in it. It seems like, as I recall from that, that film I was watching, that there was a, a, a kind of a blackened place where supposedly Moses had struck the rock and water came out. Are, are you no, that's, that? that's, that's, nonsense. Oh, that's it's, nonsense. It's volcanic mountain. You know, the whole area's got that kind of feature to it. Oh, okay. People exaggerate, you know, a lot of the things that are there, but those border markers are pretty impressive. The these calves, these images of the Egyptian calf in the middle of the desert in Arabia, the sacrificial place on top of it, the kind of the high place type sacrificial place they used to call them, mm -hmm. the cave of Elijah, the altar piece, the the columns that are there. It's it's pretty amazing because it's in the middle of nowhere. Right now, it's interesting that today you go there, and because of the kind of the um, social media or whatever these YouTube videos have come out on it. The Arabs have picked up on it and they're kind of homestaying around the area like maybe someday there'll be a holiday in there or something. So now they're building houses next to it. It's kind of ruining the, the, the feature of it but before there was nothing there at all. Oh wow. Complete wilderness. So when you see the film I made about In Search of the Real Mount Sinai you'll see that there's nothing there at all at that time. And you can mm -hmm. see the artifacts that are still there. Okay, so it's so very impressive. More and more people are kind of picking up on this as, as, a, as a potential well, place for the they're, they're Saudis are entrepreneurs, right? They're going to, they, why are these Westerners going there, you know, trying to find it? Because, you know, once, once we located it, we had probably the first GPS coordinates now and we could tell people exactly how to get there. Hmm. And so people have gone there a lot now. Now, the thing that makes this interesting is that this is what led us to the Valley of Lemuel, was actually a search for Mount Sinai. So we'd gone to Mount Sinai, and when we found this, all of a sudden I became very interested because I knew from the maps that there was a place called Midian, and there were the Jephthah's wells were there. And so what happened was, I said, let's forget Petra. I want to go down to Jethro's, see Jethro's wells and see the ruins of Midian. And so we went down to the town of Bada, which is the modern part of the town of uh, Midian. And we went there and we um, wanted to go see the wells of Jethro. And we understood those are fenced off. So we tried to get permission to see the wells by going to the mayor's office. Because we always try to go through the front door on whatever we're doing. So we went there and he couldn't give me permission. He had to get permission from the sheikh in the town of Tabuk, who's a big sheikh over the area, to give us permission, kind of like the governor of the area, to go into the fence and see the actual wells. He couldn't get that. So he said, well, I'll send my supervisor. He speaks good English. He'll take you to where the fence is, where the wells of Jethro are. So when, because it was, again, it was during the Hajj Eid and the mayor and the governor all in Mecca somewhere and they couldn't be found. So we went anyway, we went to see the wells of Jethro and you couldn't see anything. It was just a bob wire, I mean, a, a chain link fence all around this area and there's nothing to see at all and but we started talking to the to the guy there this supervisor and I had read the Quran and I had read the Moses version of the Quran you know it's in the Quran so he became really interested in how do you know all this stuff about Moses Musa and I said, well, you know, I've read the Quran. He said, are you Muslim? No, I'm a Mormon. What's that? Well, I can't really tell you. But it's, it's, it's got a lot of similar teachings, you know, to, to Islam. So he said, well, then what you need to do is you need to go to the town of Makna. And you'll see there are 12 springs, one for each of the tribes. And that's where Moses camped. Oh. And I'm thinking, Wow. That's pretty impressive. Now before, the, kind of interesting again about the wells of Jethro, I, I took a group up there again to see the, the valley that we discovered. 
but I took him to see the wells of Jethro. And there's a little kid there, a little Bedu kid, who said, don't you, don't you know there's a big hole in the fence? No. So he took us around to the back, and there's a big hole in the fence. So we just walked on through the fence, and were able to film the wells of Jethro. No way. Yeah. And so that also became public knowledge. So now everybody goes to the back of the... What we do gets out, you know, either through me or my colleagues will send it out and people find out about it, especially those who work for Aramco. They tell each other. But this guy said, go to this town of Mockney and see there's 12 springs. So we drove there and he said, oh, and by the way, it's a miracle because the springs, they flow uphill. It's a miracle. It's been proven by engineers. Saudi engineers, which was a clue that it's probably not a miracle. Anyway, we, we ended up driving over to the Gulf of Aqaba, to this town of Bakna. It's a little town on the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. And if you notice in your Book of Mormon, when it talks about the Valley of Lemuel being on the Red Sea, that it opened to the Red Sea, there'll be a footmark there, footnote that says Gulf of Aqaba. Okay, now as we came into the, the town of of uh, Magna, I noticed kind of on the left side above the of the city, there was a large grove of palm trees, date palms. So it was like an oasis there. And so we got down to the to the town, and the supervisor from the previous city. Al-Bada told us, meet the supervisor named Mohammed from the city of Makna, which is no more than probably three or four hundred people maximum. Um, and he will show you where the springs are, where there's 12 springs that flow uphill. Wow. So we got there, and of course, Mohammed was at Mecca. He wasn't there. <laughs> so, okay, we got to find a way to find these, these springs. So we looked for a government office so we could ask for permission to go see the springs. So we, we see this large kind of complex of offices and, and housing just to the north side of this little town. And it had a Saudi flag flying on. We thought, well, we'll just go there and ask whoever, whatever official this is, where the, quote, waters of Moses are located. That's what we call them, the waters of Moses. So we get there. It turns out it's a Coast Guard station, and it patrols the Gulf of Aqaba on the Arab side. And the everything north of that area is restricted because drug dealers from Egypt would put drugs in the water, and the current would take them or the drugs around, and they would then come up on the shore on the Saudi side. And so then the Saudi gangsters, whatever, would go and pick up these crates that had drugs in them. So the Saudis would patrol that whole area and made it restricted. And that's one of the jobs of the Coast Guard that was there. The, everything north of this town, at least for the next 25 miles, was restricted area. So we went there asking for permission to actually find the waters of Moses. And they said, who are you guys? What do you want? Now, it was just myself and Craig Thorstead at this point, just two of us. And um, they wanted to know if we'd been in the military. Craig had been. Oh, they took our passports. They wanted to, the captain had to interview us. Where did you want to go and look, look for the waters of Moses for? No, we're just on vacation, you know. Just <laughs> We're told by this guy, come, you know. It's very interesting, you know. And here we are being integrated for hours by this captain. And as he finally gave us permission to go to the waters of Moses, he said, okay, you'll go there with an escort, no photographs at all. <laughs> wow, this is really more than we thought about. <laughs> so as we're leaving his office, I said, where are these waters of Moses? He said, oh, they're 12 kilometers or seven some miles to the north. I'm thinking, I thought it was supposed to be here at Makna in this village. I thought it was up there maybe where those date palms were. Okay. 
it didn't dawn on me until later that the springs that the guy was talking about were actually at Machna. But because we had gone to the Coast Guard station looking for permission to see the, the waters of Moses, that they assumed that we wanted to see the second waters of Moses. <laughs> that was in the restricted area. Otherwise, why are we there? We could have just gone over and seen them, right? So they assumed through serendipity that we wanted to go to the second campsite of Moses. So the whole idea is that at the southern end of Sinai, the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea at the Straits of Tiran. They went 35 miles up and they came to where the bitter waters were. And I explained in my video what, why those were the bitter waters and how Moses cured them. But that would have been the first campsite after they crossed the Red Sea was at Machna, where there were these springs. So later it's dawned on me that the captain had assumed that we wanted to see the, the second waters of Moses. The first waters of Moses had to be there. So we went back there and indeed the police chief of the area who I'd befriended showed me all 12 of the springs that flowed up. And they actually flow up, they go down through the orchards and it looks like for an area that it's actually flowing uphill. It's not, but he has a kind of an illusion that the waters actually leave these basins where there's these springs and they go uphill. So that was the first actual um, campsite of Moses after they crossed the Red Sea. The second campsite of Moses was a place called Elam, okay, in Exodus 15, 27, Elam, where there were, it says, there were three score and ten um, palms, and there were 12 wells, one for each tribe. Okay? So basically, they didn't count 70 trees. You're talking about the 70 and the 12. It's priesthood symbolism. Okay? Okay. So that would have been the second campsite of Moses. Now, I didn't know any of this at the time or thinking about this at the time. I just wanted to see the waters of Moses. So he said, it's 12 miles to the north. I'm thinking I'm going to see 12 springs and some water going uphill. So we start going along the, the Kofa Vakaba with our military guards. And we're, we all of a sudden we come to this mountain range. And they've built a little road along the side of the, the, the mountain range. It goes right into the, right into the Red Sea, or the Gulf of Aqaba, this mountain range. And they built just single wide little dirt road you know, next to the water around this mountain range. So they could patrol the, the drugs, you know, to patrol for drugs. So the last couple of miles were on this little road, and all of a sudden it turns, and you face this magnificent, unbelievable valley, or canyon, it's more of a canyon, where the cliffs come out of the water, they go up 2,500 feet straight up. Maybe the width between those is about 100 feet. It looks like something out of the movie King Kong or something. It's just a Hollywood thing. I go, this is unbelievable. It's a huge canyon. And right on the beach there, there's some palm trees. It's just gorgeous. So we stop and they say, this is where it is. They, they, they hike us up this trail, these, these uh, soldiers. And this is where we're going for the waters of Moses. So as so we're hiking up this trail, all of a sudden we see the small stream coming down through the canyon. And I say to Craig, we're, we're in the Valley of Lemuel. This is exactly where it's supposed to be located. This canyon is certainly immovable and steadfast. I mean, it's made out of granite. It's, it's just spectacular. And you have this river that's flowing, the stream that's flowing. It's the middle of summertime, we've got a river that's flowing. Ask the soldiers, this flow all year? Oh yeah, it flows all the time. So we hike up through this canyon about four miles, and we come to what we call the upper valley. And in the upper valley, there are wells, okay? And they told us, oh, there's 12 wells up here. This is, a, this is where Moses camped. Wow, but this has got to be the Valley of Lemuel. But I had no photographs. 
Okay, so anyway, we came out of there. I went back to um, our our group there in, in Saudi Arabia and said, you know, we found Mount Sinai. We got photographs of Mount Sinai. But there's something bigger. I mean, we, we, we think we found the Valley of Landmill. But I have no photographs. So <laughs> over the years again, uh, befriended the captain. He let us go into there, take photographs. We found a back way in from the inland area, so we didn't have to go through the restricted area. We come in through the backside, um, the way Lehi would have come in, and so we were able to photograph that and count the 12 wells and all that. So it's pretty much, we believe that the Valley of Lamech is actually the, also the second waters of Moses, where Moses and the children of Israel camped. Now, wouldn't Lehi have known that or not? Is that, is that something that he would have known? I think the locals would have told him that, yes, that's where they, they were. It's very interesting because it's only about, I'd say, 20 miles at max between, now you have to go through some mountains, but between where Lehi would have camped and what we believe is the real Mount Sinai. And if you remember Nephi, when he had his vision of the, what his father had dreamed, he was taken by an angel to an exceedingly high mountain, which is the same wording that's used about Mount Sinai. It's an exceedingly high mountain. So it's very interesting So you're, you're, that so you're maybe trying... by the spirit or whatever, he was taken, Nephi himself was taken to Mount Sinai. Wow. Okay, because 20 miles apart, he went to an exceedingly high mountain that he hadn't seen before. And there he was received the revelation. It was a temple. Mount Sinai was a, de a dedicated temple of the children of Israel and probably is still to this day a dedicated temple. Hmm. Might have been you know, desecrated by us, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but it was a temple. Where else would Nephi have been taken by an angel? Just some old mountain somewhere when there's a temple 20 so miles you, away? So you think that Nephi went to Mount Sinai? I don't know that, but I mean, yeah. why not? You know, it, it makes sense. That's cool. That he went to Mount Sinai. Hmm. Even Joseph Smith was taken to an exceedingly high mountain when he had the vision that Moses had. Was he taken there? Huh. It's very, very interesting. Okay. Wow. wow. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with George. In our next conversation, we'll talk about Lehi's trail and the path that he took to get out of Jerusalem. Between the valley and Mount Sinai was the western branch of the famous Frankincense Trail that ran through the whole um, west side of Arabia was the Frankincense Trail. So Jeremiah wrote about it, Ezekiel wrote about the Frankincense Trail. So obviously anybody in Lehi's time would have known about the Frankincense Trail. Lehi was probably a merchant because he knew the different languages. So we figure he was probably a rich merchant and that he would have certainly known about the trade routes. That would have been like today going from LA to, to Salt Lake, you take I-15. That was the only freeway at the time. In fact, the only trail at the time. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you like our page on facebook.com slash gospel tangents. You can subscribe at YouTube at youtube.com slash gospel tangents. We're also on Twitter at Gospel Tangents, as well as make sure that you subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss any of our episodes. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our videos. Thanks again.